we'll um, we'll rebegin or recommence um, when when everyone is in. He finally acceded to Johnny's request and they took the two lanes back to Sullivan's again that night. Well then, <clears throat> a few nights later, John L explained to his mother that they were moving... So after that, uh, initial contribution <coughs> from Barry Sheehan focusing on a military historical uh, view of the revolutionary conflict from a largely British, that is to say, counterinsurgency and, uh, point of view. The next contribution from Eve Morrison <coughs> is from one of a rising generation of historians who have been working on the resources, the riches of the Bureau of Military History in Ireland, and that is where Eve has done much of her groundbreaking work uh, as a doctoral stu student, um, and then subsequently at the UCD Centre for War Studies, where she worked on a project remembering violence and war, contextualising the early, early O'Malley uh, diaries. She's done a wide range of work, particularly uh, using the diaries and memoirs of people who were involved in the uh, revolutionary period and been fearless in her uh, interrogation of those as sources uh, and, and what she has uncovered I think continues to be fascinating and is, as Barry's work is, ongoing. So it's a real pleasure to have Eve here and to hear her talk on the subject, Cork Ghosts of the Irish Revolution. Eve Morrison. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, okay, uh, first of all, I'd, like to, I'd just like to thank the organisers for, for inviting me uh, to speak. As, as some of you, uh, I, I mean, what I'm going to talk about now is about as far away from, from what Barry Sheen was talking about in his paper, in his excellent paper, uh, as, as you can get. It mightn't be to everybody's taste. We'll just have to see. Uh, because what I'm going to talk about today is oral history and, and social memory and the crossover between them. I was originally, as some of you might know, I was going to talk about the Kill Michael Ambush, uh, but I changed my mind, uh, not out of fear or anything. It was just that I'm in the middle of writing something. It's not in press yet, and I'm not going to, and I, and I'm not going to give any papers about it until it is. If you want to invite me back down after it's published, I'll happily come. And then, to be honest with you, I'm going to move on <laughs> because it's been going on for long enough. Um, uh, but, I, but I will answer any questions about it, particularly in light of, of some of the letters that have been raging back and forth on the Southern Star over the past few weeks. If, I don't know if any of you have seen them. Um, so I'm not going to talk about Kill Michael directly, but what, if, what I'm going to talk about is still, I think, relevant to that debate. Um, and w a lot, if anybody's interested, a lot of what I'm going to say today is, uh, has been recently published in a chapter, uh, in, t uh, in a book. In the, I actually can't remember the name of the book. It's Nerves, I think. Um, <laughs> but my chapter is called Hauntings of the Irish Revolution. Uh, and so a lot of what I'm going to say today is, 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 is taken from, from that chapter. Um, so uh, I, think, I, th I think I better just start a little bit and just explain where I'm coming from uh, before I get to the heart of things. Uh, as Simon said, I specialize essentially in legacy interviews and personal testimony from separatist nationalist veterans of the Irish Revolution and Civil War. And by that I mean uh, former members of the Irish Volunteers, the IRA, Cumann Amon, Fianna Aaron, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, Sinn Féin, etc. And I've done uh, most of my, my doctoral and postdoctoral work on the Bureau of Military History and the Ernie O'Malley Notebooks. Uh, I'm never really sure whether to call myself an, an oral historian or not, because although I've done oral history interviews and I use them, it's not really what I do. What I do is look at other people's oral history projects, so I'm not sure how I qualify there. Um, uh, and when I think when I, I, I began my PhD a long time ago, 2003, um, and when I started that, I think I was thinking in terms of a fairly straightforward extraction of accurate and relevant details about the revolutionary period. Um, but about halfway through my PhD, something like that, um, I discovered oral history and oral history methodology and memory studies, and it, it really kind of changed everything and, it, and opened up a new approach to the text that I was reading. And it, and it gives you, I think, tools for analyzing them that traditional historical uh, methodology doesn't do. I was very lucky in meeting Guy Biner somewhere along the way who was very encouraging of what, what I was trying to do. Uh, and of course, my supervisor, Dave Fitzpatrick, who's there. Uh, it was very helpful as well, and he certainly put me through my paces, as you can imagine. Um, but, but, so, so, but when I reorientated that sort of practice, I started looking at the interviews uh, in a more interpretive way. 
if, uh, and, and what that means is that it, you, you, you're more interested in contextualizing them um, and, and, and looking at the co different contexts affecting the interviews. You know, so, so like they, they do certainly contain an enormous amount of information about the revolutionary period, but what became much more uh, visible from this approach was the influence of the years that had passed since the events that they were discussing, you know, the modern context of the 1940s and 50s, you know, all the different allegiances uh, and rows that had happened in the intervening period, the military service pensions, all these things influenced what they said in the 1940s and 50s, and you really have to take that into account when you're using sources like that. Um, and so, you know, and so, the, and that's not, that wouldn't be the traditional historical approach. The traditional historical approach, as I said, would be towards these sorts of retrospective sources would either be like not to use them at all, or if you did use them uh, to, to just, as I said, just to extract what you thought what was trustworthy. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not against this approach as such. If you're in a story and that's part of your job, all right, is, is to establish how accurate uh, the information is. It's what cognitive psychologists refer to as the veridicality or the, or the truth content of a personal story. And you have to know that, all right? And to begin with that, you, to, you know, to order to use it or, uh, if effectively. It doesn't so much matter when you're, if you're an anthropologist or a folklorist, but if you're an historian and you're going to use them, you do have to do that. Um, however, when you look at them more interpretively, you can, you know, it, 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 the, how, how factually accurate about them is still important, but it's not as important. And, and sometimes the inaccuracies um, are, are, you know, are very instructive as well. Uh, and so what you're looking at, how the memories are, are structured um, and to understand the context, but, and also to look at, if you like, the social function of the memory, right? and why stories are told a cer certain way by people, you know? So, and so that, um, and so, you know, and so as, as I began doing that, I also began looking for other sets of interviews um, to compare them with as, um, and, and memoirs. And because both the Bureau and Ernie O'Malley covered the whole country, I ended up traipsing from, from Northern Ireland right down here to West Cork, uh, back and forth looking for other sets of interviews. Um, and once I started looking, I found them. And, there's, and there really are lots of interviews out there, and I would encourage everybody to see if you can you know, find them, or if you do, or, you know, and there's lots of people who have them who, who aren't comfortable um, coming forward with them. Um, but, and, but the collectors uh, you know, uh, fall into kind of four main categories. Uh, there was the, they were the veterans themselves, um, the children of the veterans, the relatives of the veterans introducing their, their parents, priests and local historians. Priests played a particularly prolific and conspicuous, and conspicuous role in local history in Ireland. Um, and they, you know, they, were, they were very prominent in establishing uh, local history groups. They, were, they, they wrote histories themselves. They ghostwrit other ones. They organized to, you know, to, to collect material and to collect projects and everything, you know, so they were really heavily involved. This is one of the things I discovered. Uh, prob and probably the largest of these were, um, uh, collections was uh, done by uh, a priest based in Armagh. This is Father Lewis O'Kane. He did these in the late 60s, 1970s. I know it's a long way from West Cork, uh, but he did about 400 interviews and they're fabulous. He was a really good interviewer. Uh, uh, but his interviews are like, they're mostly people in, in South Derry and in Tyrone and Belfast and Armagh little bit in, in Donegal. Um, most of the other interviews that I've looked at are on a much smaller scale. Um, now, and the vast majority of people who were interviewed in them are, were veterans, but also within these, you know, there were interviewed a few people who were either children or relatives of, of veterans or their children during the revolutionary period. And they were interviewed as well. And what they tend to talk about is that, that you know, the, the stories and the events that were told to them, right, and that were recounted to them kind of interspersed with really vague memories from their childhood. And I'm going to play two excerpts from, from two of these interviews uh, from West Cork in a, in a little while. Now, as I'm sure I don't have to tell you, remembered history is a very loaded con concept in Ireland, and it's really, unfortunately, kind of weighted down with polemic um, and in the classic kind of confrontations about revisionism in the, in the 1980s and 90s, um, 
that, you know, over, over pop, anti-revisionists tend to, tend to present popular memory of colonialism and Irish attempts to challenge British rule as the authentic tradition of a risen people, uh, whereas anti-revisionists, you know, were much more inclined to deride it as a dangerous mythology, uh, eliding or, or, or pro even promoting uh, political violence. Uh, now, I mean, I'm being a little bit simplistic. There was lots of variations on the theme, on the theme but in a nutshell, uh, that, that's what it was about. Now, and I'm going to say here, revisionists, anti-revisionists are not terms I use or accept. I have to there because other people call themselves that. Uh, but I don't agree with it, be, uh, very simply because I think if, if you start thinking about your research in a writing that way, you begin automatically to, st to think polemically rather than historically, and that tends to get in the way of, of your judgment, or I would certainly, it is. And so I find the whole revisionist debate incredibly limiting uh, and, and unhelpful generally. And, and, I, and neither side, I think, offers a very interesting way of analyzing memory or oral testimony certainly not with the sophistication it deserves. Um, so, I mean, I have two basic principles. I think historical research should be heuristic, which means that you derive your conclusions from the evidence you do rather than starting with the answer and, 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 try, and, and just looking for information to back that up, and that you should be as fair-minded as you can about people, and it's as simple as that. But I think Geroid Otui really hit it up the nail on the head when he pointed out in the revisions debate uh, more than two decades ago, that the problem was that both the revisionists and the anti-revisionists were making too many assumptions and unsupported generalizations about what popular historical consciousness and mentality was. They were saying, you know, he was saying you're providing no, you're making assumptions about what Irish people think, but you're not providing any evidence for what they think. And what he said was, you need to go out and, and, and find out, if you, you know, and, and, and try and find evidence for what people think and want from their history, which he says involves uh, paying using sources and texts of many kinds, many that you're not accustomed to handling, uh, and, you know, and to get more in touch with, with you know, some of the theories that, that, uh, about, you know, a memory and things like that. And so I, and I, think, pro I think it's very good advice. Uh, um, and so, and that's... <laughs> And so that's kind of what I've tried to do uh, in my work. And, I would, and what I would argue really is that, is that the personal testimonies of combatants and, and social memory of the Irish Revolution is a route to discovering this, not because it's all necessarily accurate or it's the whole story. That's not the point. All right, but if you want to know why people think the way they do and what they think, you have to go and find evidence for it. And so I'm going to show you, I'm going to play some of it for you. Um, but what I'm going to discuss in the chapter I just mentioned and what I'm going to talk about today, if you like, is kind of the crossover and the cross-fertilization between first-hand veterans' accounts, uh, whether in the Bureau of Military History or, other, or local uh, projects, and the social memory, if you like, of, of, the of the revolutionary period, which would be the stories that people heard and told. Um, and, 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 kind of, and, and so I, for, I'm going to start by looking at the influence of popular culture on the IRA accounts and then look a little bit at how the IRAs, the, the veterans' own stories, influenced and contributed to social memory. Um, and I, like in the chapter, I talked about, I gave examples from all over the island. Today, I'm going to, I'm going to play excerpts uh, from two, two West Cork interviews. Um, now, the interviews with priests and local historians have a really, really different feel, right, than the Bureau of Military History uh, and the Ernie O'Malley Notebook interviews. Uh, and one of the most striking things that I began to notice as, as I, as I uh, listened to him and looked at him is that there's a lot more references to folklore and the supernatural and ghost stories and, and things like that. And, and, uh, and I mean, this is, this is often because their interviewers were, were, were more interested in documenting popular beliefs than was either Ernie O'Malley or the Bureau. I'm thinking in particular of Jim Fitzgerald in East Cork, Father, Father Louis O'Kane, and then also Sean O'Sullivan, who was uh, Leitrim, Leitrim's county librarian, and he established the still ongoing uh, Leitrim Library Oral History Project in 1981. Now, Father, and Louis O'Kane in particular really encouraged and conjoled his interviewees to talk about local traditions and, and folklore. Um, and, and, uh, and so, you, you know, when you get a lot of, sometimes he didn't even have to encourage them. There was one man he interviewed who was actually from Dublin. Uh, he was a science teacher um, 
and he'd been, during the War of Independence, he'd been a chemistry student at the Royal College of Sciences, later became part of the UCD. During, now, during the actual War of Independence, he supposed, spent most of his time in his digs manufacturing mercury uh, fulminate for, for the IRA, which is a percussion explosive that acts as, as a detonator. He didn't actually do any fighting until the Civil War, and he took uh, the anti-treaty side. Um, but he begins this interview saying that he had an, when he was a child in Dublin, he had an encounter with one, not one, but two poltergeists. And he said that he was, and he, he, was ex, he, was, he was exercised as a baby because these poltergeists kept following him around. Now, he wasn't joking, all right? This was just a straight-up story about, about uh, his life. Um, and, the, you know, and, so, and you find this is quite, you know, this happens a lot. In the Leitrim Oral History Project, there's an IRA na veteran named Francie Bowen who... Uh, and his interview is, is full of, of references to cures by local women that extracted thorns that x-rays couldn't find, you know, and these stories of crossroads and, and, you know, the ghosts of drowned children and strange women and men with cloven hooves wandering the crossroads and all these stories that, you know, traditional stories. And he, some of them he said he saw himself other ones he just heard about, but what he says at the end of it is that since the motors came, they all left, right? So <laughs> it was kind of very culturally specific about that. And I think what that means really, like, because it changed, because these, this way of, t of talking about the War of Independence, it doesn't, it, it doesn't really happen anymore, right? I think probably after, from, from maybe the, the late 1960s, 70s, that kind of way of, of, of telling stories uh, seems to have died out. Maybe I'm wrong if some, somebody might find, a, uh, you know, can, uh, things differently. I'm happy to accept that. But also, you know, to bring it closer to home, if anybody, has anybody here heard uh, Jim Fitzgerald's interviews with, with the East Cork veterans? Now, the accent is just really hard for me to understand. <laughs> but, uh, but if you get through it, it's very interesting. Now, he, and he was really clearly very interested in documenting the supernatural folklore about uh, Nakraha, which was the very uh, infamous graveyard where the IRA kept spies. Uh, and, and there was lots and lots of supernatural folklore around Nakraha that grew up at the time about, you know, when there was strange happenings. And, uh, and so he was clearly very interested in these stories. And it was one of his interviews, it was in one of these interviews that Martin Corey, who's local IRA commander, later Feet of All TD, describes encountering a ghostly black dog while he was out on the run. And as I said, there's been almost no work done on this, but it was actually a very common way to tell stories about the War of Independence in this way. And so you can find them, they're kind of scattered across a range of sources. There's a, this very rich and fantastical folklore uh, relating to the, to, to the period. Um, it's a, you know, not very many people have, have done that much about it. The exception would be uh, Tomas McConmara's uh, PhD. He, he, and he, I got in touch with him when I first started looking at this. He did a PhD about oral history, tradition, social memory in, in, the, in the War of Independence in, in Clare. And so he'd interviewed, you know, and he was interviewed documents. And I said, look, Tomas, am I mad? You know, or are, there, or are there lots of, or I'm coming across all these ghost stories. Is this just happening? He said, no, no, I have a whole chapter on that. You know, and so, and so I said, oh, okay. Uh, you know, and so it's just, and you find these, you know, in their stories are, you have Captain Lendrum's car, who was a magistrate waylaid and killed by the local IRA in September 1920. People would talk about seeing his car on the roads at night. Uh, the locations of, of the Rinine and the Glenwood ambushes in, in Clare were both said to be haunted by the men who died there in Mulla, for instance, in 1928. The, the Irish Independent reported... Uh, or sorry, yeah, the Irish Independent reported that the residents were afraid to leave their homes after dark because there was a, the ghost of a soldier who was wandering the roads. And apparently, and, and Tomas told me that this story is not just, it's, he'd heard it for, for other parts of Clare and not just Mulla. And there's examples of this everywhere. You know, in Dromore, for instance, the Dromore murders in April 21, which were a particular set of really grisly sectarian killings carried out by loyalists and Catholics in, in Tyrone, for instance, prophesied that none of the culprits would ever die in his bed. And according to the tale, uh, sure enough, the three local uh, loyalists suspected of having committed the killings came to bad ends and they, and they weren't lying in their beds. One died in a road accident and apparently his ghost haunted the site where he was... Uh, 
where he met his end. Another drowned and a third died sitting in a chair next to his bed. Um, you know, so, and this was, these are stories that are very common. If you read, for instance, uh, my Five Friars Freedom by, by Dan Breen, you'll note that after Sean Tracy was gunned down in October 1920 on a Talbot Street in Dublin, Tracy's ghost appeared at the foot of Dan Breen's hospital bed. All right? In the, and in, in the, kind of, this was in the lingo, there was a revival of spiritualism, and, you know, and, and, all, and seances and things in the interwar period. Uh, you know, and so in the kind of the paranormal lingo at the time, this sort of thing was known as a crisis apparition somebody who appears to you at the, at the moment of your death. And there were stories, British soldiers who died here haunted the place where they died. There was a British soldier who haunted Mount Street in Dublin, who was, he was killed in 1916. Uh, Michal McLeamore, who's the actor and author, swore he encountered the ghosts of several British officers killed by the IRA on Bloody Sunday when he was staying in a house where, where uh, they had been killed. Um, so, I mean, I've just like, see, I love these. I'm probably going on too much about them. But, um, <laughs> but now I'm going to play you an, a, like, a, a, an excerpt from, from a West Cork interview. Um, and this is from, uh, this is one of John Chisholm's interviews with a man named uh, Bill O'Donoghue. He was the younger brother of Jeremiah O'Donoghue, who was one of three uh, IRA volunteers from Bannon who were killed on the 2nd of December 1920 uh, in, in an isolated laneway called Laurel Walk. Um, the two other volunteers were John Galvin and uh, Joseph Begley. Um, now, they'd arranged to, to buy arms off soldiers from the local barracks, uh, but in the end, they, they ended up walking straight into a trap. There was a British patrol uh, laying in wait for them, and all three were killed. After this event, two British Army deserters from the Essex Regiment, Percy Taylor and Thomas Watling, who were being held captive by the IRA and who had helped them make contact with the soldiers in the barracks, were accused basically of double crossing the IRA uh, and they were executed. Uh, and so um, O'Donoghue tells, this, this, tells the story of both uh, the killing of his brother and the killing of the soldiers. I'm not, so, and I'm going to play for you now uh, the story of the killing of, of, of the soldiers. It's about, it's about seven minutes long, but it's interesting, don't worry. The two, the two men who deserted. Uh, one of them, as far as I remember, his name was Taylor, and the other, uh, Watson, no, Watkins, Watkins, that's Gabe Burns, that his wife was Watkins, was she? She was, yes. yes, that's how I remember it, actually. Yes. Well, yes. Um, but um, they, they stayed, or they were kept at the home of John L. Sullivan, now TD, at Cali Grove, Clannacilty, to be, say, maybe halfway is between Clannacilty and Moss Cambry. I see. Was that a loyalist house? It was. Um, so John? John L's father was James O'Sullivan, and there were three boys in the family, John L and Pat, actually. Pat is up here on the South Main Street. He gave you a lot of information about it. Mm. He has a shop, you know, about hippies. Uh, John L, Pat, and the other brother, Dan, the three boys, actually, were out in the volunteers. Yeah. So... They were kept in that house. Well, my brother Jimmy actually made contact with them uh, about the 23rd of the 24th of November because my maternal grandfather lived uh, in the next farm to John L. Mm -hmm. And he died uh, in the last week in November 1920 with the result that my Jimmy went out to the funeral and actually spent some time talking to Doris Lenz, probably maybe making final arrangements or something like that, you see. But in any case, um, old Mrs. O'Sullivan, that's John Hill's mother, was very, very fond of them, evidently. One of them in particular was a very nice lad. I think he was a Scotchman. Yes. And uh, she was very fond of them. But immediately that word arrived evidently in Cali Grove and in the Clannacilty area that those three lanes uh, had been shot here in Bendon, the boys outside decided, well, uh, whether they got on, there's no one, not Pat Sullivan or John Hill could tell you that, but um, they, in any case, decided that these fellas had double-crossed them and that they were to execute them. So, 
Johnny O'Sullivan and his brother Pat got shovels and spades and all the necessary equipment like that to dispose of the bodies and took the two lads with them. But um, Mrs. O'Sullivan, Janelle's mother, guessed what they were about to do and she mentioned that she said, you never, I know what you're about to do and you'll never have a day's luck if you do it and so on like that. With the result that um, Janelle couldn't face his mother that night without the two lands and they took them down to a field near Milltown Chapel. You see, that was the local chapel. And they met Jim Hurley there, that's the late Jim Hurley. And um, John L. explained to him that they couldn't execute them that night because his mother, like that, he couldn't face his mother without the two lands, and that he preferred that they take them back home and do it some other night. So uh, Jim was rather reluctant, like he felt they should carry out their orders, and that was that. But however, he finally acceded to John Hill's request and they took the two lanes back to Sullivan's again that night. Well then, <coughs> a few nights later, John Hill explained to his mother that they were moving the lanes to a different house. But then, <coughs> actually, I think what they did was they took them <coughs> to some place near either Kilmeen or Kilbree and um, they executed them there. <coughs> Janelle did tell the story that one of them was a perfect soldier um, that they asked him, I think Dan Hartley Clannock, he was there and Dan felt that you couldn't shoot a man like without first getting him to say some few prayers and that and uh, he told the lad like to um, say whatever few prayers he wanted to say and the lad said he didn't wish to say any prayers and get on with the job as quickly as they could and finally then said to him uh, something like he said blast your man haven't you got a soul and your man just pointed at the soul with his boot he said it's the only soul i've got but <clears throat> the other day um he gave them like his home address and different little things like that to um, send on to his wife and that but that um <coughs> some people say you see that um there are conflicting accounts of it that, that this fellow didn't actually double cross but that um, there were two men of the same name in the back you see we, I'm not sure now whether it was Taylor I think it was Taylor was oh, the yes, yeah. but I think Taylor was him and who had the brother in the back mm -hmm. but there was another Taylor there as well in the back and that evidently when they let her there was no question, I think, in the letter that there could be a double cross because they had superintended the, or supervised the right the writing. Right, so somebody said that. yes. But then <clears throat> some people say that whoever was in charge of the post in the bag, that he was a new man on the job and that he gave, he gave the letter to the wrong team and that that's that he handed it up, of course, to the commanding officer and that that was the point about it. Yes. Yes. Um, actually, like as a point of interest, we worked with people out around Calligrove who at that time, we say around 1920 maybe to 1928, were very superstitious at that time in the country. Um, they used to tell that um, very often in our servants' house that they could hear the footsteps coming up the stairs of, of this fellow. Mm. of whom Mrs. Austin was very fond of coming back up the stairs at mm. night and then mm. you know. Yes. But <laughs> now, I don't know, if, if could people understand that? Yeah, okay, see, so you notice now there, Father Chisholm was a priest who was not comfortable with ghost stories at all. You see, he said, oh, right, click, tape goes off. Um, and so he, you know, so, so he, he was a different kettle of fish. But actually, that story, now, if you, if if anybody's familiar with uh, with with the story of of the killings in Bandon Walk, you'll you'll know that that uh, the 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 story about about the 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 letter that actually the two soldiers hadn't double crossed uh, the IRA at all. That that what they were basically said that they that the letter was handed to the wrong tailor, the wrong soldier named Taylor. Uh, now we have looked it up. There was another soldier Taylor. There was two brothers there named Taylor. So the thing is, is it could. 
uh, this certainly could be true. This was a well-known kind of counter-narrative to, and if you notice, that version contradicts what Tom Berry said in, in Guerrilla Days in Ireland. Um, and, you know, and, and so this, this other story has all, was always there. It was in the Southern Star. It wasn't like it was a secret or anything. Um, but, uh, and as you also notice at the end, there's, there's a ghost uh, of the soldier who stayed in, in John L. L's uh, mother's house. And so I suppose the first question you have to ask yourself is actually how you, how you use this sort of material, you know, should you consider somebody who, who, who tells a ghost story to be of that generation to be completely, to be completely unreliable, right? That's it, you know, do you dismiss Martin Corey's uh, interview because of the black, do black dog story? Uh, I would argue not, all right? Not necessarily. Within the context of the time, no. Unless you have some other evidence that he's schizophrenic or something, no. Um, and I, uh, and, I think, so, and I think you're much better off trying to f find out uh, and establishing how common or uncommon these sorts of beliefs were. And, and as I said, exploring the social function of these. And if you're interested in this, Angela Burke does wonderful work on, on if you like, the, 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 the social functions of folklore uh, in, in rural Irish societies. Um, however, it's important to point out that Irish people were really not more suspicious than anybody else. It, at the time. The, um, if you look at studies of, of British and European popular culture, uh, the extent to which de-Christianization and secularization and modernization and the decline of religious institutions, and the extent to which all these forces has eroded belief in the supernatural in Western societies was really very much exaggerated at the time. In, in evangelical revivals in Scotland and Ireland, Great War trenches, rural France and interwar Britain, they were just awash with visions and miracles and, and faith healers and spiritualists and fairies and animate statues of saints and apparitions. It was, you know, and, and so, uh, you know, and according to one British folklorist calculation in the 1940s, every mile of the uh, Warwickshire countryside had its own ghost. You know, so that, I mean, I suppose today people believe in Reiki and homeopathic medicine and things like that. So, you know, so still, <laughs> and I think that's kind of, kind of the equivalent. But, but, but so, so, you know, within that context, you know, fairy stories in Ireland, ghost stories don't seem, they don't really stand out at all, you know. Um, I mean, if anything, for instance, it's, it's the preferred social, uh, fo uh, preferred focus and cultural reference points of uh, Irish modern, modernis, modernizers and, and separatists in the 19th, early 20th century were, were, were tended to be historical and, and related to the, to, the, uh, to the old Gaelic world, in part because British establishment figures who were opposing uh, British home rule and self-governments, or sorry, opposing the ending of British rule and opposed self-government for Ireland, maintained that basically uh, Irish people weren't fit for home rule because they were too uh, super, superstitious. Uh, and as we, and, and this, was, this was certainly not the case. Uh, and it's also true that what, what people refer to as the verification of popular culture in the Victorian period uh, and early had been largely a, a conservative and unionist uh, undertaking, and it kind of suited them to, to, to people who were opposed to home rule to, to portray Irish people in this way. Um, and, it, it, and it's also true by the time of the Irish Revolutionary Period that, that, that it was becoming, uh, you know, that, that supernatural experiences were, were increasingly being characterized as, as a sign of pathological imbalance and hallucinations and things. But it, it, it doesn't seem to have had that much impact on popular culture here. Or, or in Europe or anywhere else. So if you look at the, one of the standout characteristics of the Irish Folklore Commission's uh, archive, which is, and these were collected from 1935 to 71, is just the sheer volume of supernatural uh, legend it contains. Um, so, I mean, so Ian, and this is not to say that most but, you know, IRA men and things were, were, weren't skeptical of this. I'm sure they, you know, of this sort of thing, I'm sure they were. All I'm saying is that it's not surprising in this context that sometimes these local stories take on these characteristics and I don't think it's grounds for uh, dismissing somebody. So Martin Corey might be an extremely unreliable narrator, but uh, it's not because of the black dog story. You know, it's, it's uh, uh, I mean, for it's, it's interesting and, and you have to remember the importance of who they're talking to in the interest of the interviewer is all very important. Uh, Martin Corey, for instance, didn't tell Ernie O'Malley the black dog story or if he did, Ernie didn't write it down you know, because he, he wasn't interested. 
Um, and as I said, both the Bureau and O'Malley were, were, they were kind of focusing on sourcing operational accounts of military actions and military organizations. Uh, and with a view to legitimizing, you know, historic claims to, to Irish independence and, and, and legitimizing the war wage to achieve it, or in Ernie O'Malley's case, a certain side taken in, in the Civil War. They weren't interested in documenting uh, uh, local cu culture, popular culture, the way O'Kane and some of these other people were. So that's part of the reason why you don't get that, this sort of material, even though there's a little bit in, in the Bureau, and, and actually a little bit in O'Malley, but not nearly as much. Um, so, I mean, if that's kind of a, like the context of which, in which, you know, popular culture influenced their accounts and influenced social memory, I want to, it's also the case that what the veterans said and the stories that they told contributed to how it was remembered uh, in local areas. And, you know, now, so, so while it was, it was, of course, true that some IRA veterans were reluctant to discuss uh, some incidents. They were very circumspect, uh, circumspect when they were interviewed. Sometimes veterans lied. Sometimes they jointly agreed uh, what, what to say beforehand. But not all of them did, ever. Uh, and attempts to silence or censor memory of certain events, even very controversial ones, uh, was never entirely successful. And sometimes, indeed, IRA men were very candid when they were speaking to people that they trusted, uh, and again, who were interested in hearing the unvarnished truth, if you like. And I mean, it's always important to remember not everybody is interested in the unvarnished truth, you know. Um, and you can certainly find people who refuse to accept anything but the version of events, you know, uh, recounted in classic IRA uh, memoirs and anvil fighting stories. Um, but, you know, really, you know, there's, that, that's only one, that one portion of, of the population. A lot of people who don't feel that way. Um, and the thing is, and, and, and although it's suggested a lot of the time that popular memory of the, of the period kind of idealizes or romanticizes violence or excises the grim realities of it, I actually really haven't found that to be true, at least, at least not, not in Cork. Uh, and, and, and what I find is that there's a, bit, there's a big divide between uh, the social memory on the ground, right, which is much more nuanced and complex and interesting, and the public discourse relating to events like the Kill Michael ambush, which, you know, which tends to be just completely overrun with bullies and internet trolls and polemicists, uh, uh, you know, using, using history of the revolutionary period to, to either support or drive modern, modern day republicanism. You know, I think they're two sides of the same coin, and as far as I'm concerned, it's a plague on both their houses. You know, it's just a distraction. What's, and what, underneath these public confrontations, the surviving oral and written evidential fragments of personal social memory relating to the period are really just too diverse to, con to either conform or to condone any one set of belief or any one side in these arguments. And if you, and the, if you don't know that, it's because you haven't done enough work. It's as simple as that. Um, and, so, and so the point is, is how you find it. How do you find local memory? How do you, you know, and, and, and that's the hard part. And actually the internet, even though, you know, if you're somebody like me, you get attacked on it a lot. Uh, it's actually making it a lot easier, all right, to, to, to get in touch with people and to access, you know, alternative stories. And, it's, and, and in fact, and I think probably it has a lot of potential uh, in that way. And this became very clear to me one day when I was just doing, I think I was bored, I was, just did an open, open Google search about a woman named Bridget Noble, who was one of the, one of the three w women we know were deliberately killed by the IRA during the War of Independence, and um, she was killed in West Cork. That uh, uh, was Mary Lindsay and Kitty Carroll were the other two women. Um, now, you know, because the, like, the, you know, the IRA is forbidden to, to, to execute women, it didn't happen very often. All right, but the, this is one of the cases it did. Now, she was, Bridget Noble, uh, for those of you who don't know, was, uh, was executed by members of the Castletown Bear Battalion of the West Cork Brigade in 1921. They said that uh, their local RAC contacts had told them that Noble had basically been giving them information, They and it had accused uh, a local IRA man of killing somebody, a man named uh, William Lahan. And she'd also apparently given the names of seven local volunteers who bobbed her hair for associating with the police. So she'd already been, like, they'd already come and cut off her hair and everything. And she didn't, she didn't back down. She kept speaking to the police. 
Um, now, I suppose since the, I see the, the Cork spy files have come out, they have, a, they, have uh, they, they talk about Bridget Noble, so it's a bit more well known than it used to be. Uh, but but she was, she, I think she was probably the least known of the three. Uh, uh, and her, as far as I know, her body was never recovered. The man who was reputed to have executed her was dead by the 1930s. Uh, none, of the, none of the Castletown Bear Battalion veterans who gave witness statements to Bureau of Military History mention her at all. Uh, there's a couple of, she's listed in some of the, the Michael Collins papers, but really there wasn't, there, there wasn't a whole lot of, of extra, inform, more information about her. You know, there's a couple of letters from her husband when he's looking for her. Until I was doing this Google search and, uh, and I chanced upon a website of a musician and producer of Cork. He does kind of electronic music. And he had a piece of music entitled Mrs. Noble. And I said, that can't be the Mrs. Noble. This can't be the, a piece of electronic music, you know, with synthesizer. And, um, you know, and so, so, you know, we made contact with him and you know what? It was a song about Mrs. Noble. Uh, and the man, and it ends up his father had, had interviewed people from the area where she lived in, in I, I mean, we think it's kind of the late 60s, early 1970s. Uh, and this man sent me an excerpt from one of the interviews his father had conducted with one of, of Bridget Noble's neighbors. Her name was Eva Sullivan. She was from Ard Groom Inner, the townland where Mrs. Noble lived. Um, and I'm going to, uh, to play for you now this, this clip about, of, of her, her talking about Mrs. Noble. Uh, it's just about uh, five minutes long. Noble, were well, there nobles living around there? Mm -hmm. There was a Mrs. A Mrs. Noble. A Mrs. Noble. Well, where did Mrs. Noble go? Who disappeared? The, the diehard shot. No. Go on. Uh, her name was Neil, and she married this Cooper that came. I don't know what's an Englishman or not. She married anyway. She married Noble. We never knew Noble. I don't know, did he die or what? Or did he run away from her? But she was there with her father on her own. She lived not far from Tim Catty's now. Yeah. And uh, anyway, the time of the Civil War, no, the time of the English and Irish War, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. she, uh, she was telling tales out of school anyway to the military, yeah. and she was tailed up. Her hair was bobbed first, she got a warning, and then one evening, after the hair being bobbed, she knew what was coming. She set out for Castletown, and I'm sure she was coming to Furious Pier to the British Army. I have a feeling maybe she was. But she set off walking. Do you remember the Den Holland pump that used to drive the red car up to our groom and Alley, isn't that? Dan Holland, yeah, Dan Holland was out that day with the bread and she asked Dan for a lift in. So Dan Holland and Jim Shearer used to drive for Warners. Yeah. And, uh, well, she asked Dan for a lift and Dan had been warned. So he couldn't say no, but he said, be walking away, he said. Be walking away, he said, I'll pick him up. He had no intention of leaving our room. He stayed on and on and left her go away. And she was just going down the hill towards the ridges when they came along and captured her. And... Uh, I heard all about it. She was taken to a shed in Ballycravan. And she was gagged, of course, and tied up there. I don't know how many days she was there, days and nights, but she was there the day that the army sloop came in 
landed the petrol for burning the wire's house, BM the wire's house, old home. They burned two that day. Okay, they burned the wires and they burned your Connors away in an Inverdale room. But they passed as close as I'm to you, you know, to that shed where she was tied up with the tins of petrol to go burning the houses. And then she was taken from there by a boat down the Kinmare River and she was taken in at Carlos. I don't know why they didn't do it where they <laughs> where she was in Ballycraman. They shot her at Carlos and buried her there. A shallow grave, I suppose. I heard to the wet one. That's what happened at the end of the novel. <laughs> I heard that she had put her she was thrown overboard. Pardon? I heard that she was taken out the boat and thrown overboard. Mm -hmm. That's what I heard. 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 Because the man from Clean Bay shot her. Don't you? Happy Dan. They wrote a song in the ballad. Hmm? They wrote a ballad about her then. Yeah. Well, where are we at in Mrs. Noble Bowl? I don't know any more of it. Okay. Now, that is. Uh, now the thing is, in, in both of those clips, in both of those stories, not every detail is correct. Okay, and some of it I don't, you know, and, and a lot of it are, are like, they, you know, they have some of the characteristics of, of you know, of, of, of stories, the way, you know, lots of, lots of, of folkloric elements in that. But actually, the, but, but, there, but, it's, but it's a mix. But some of the information uh, is accurate, um, as far as we know. Now, the, the thing is, is like, the, 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 um, Liam Dwyer's house was burnt many days after they say that they uh, executed Mrs. Mrs. Noble. So either she, either either uh, Eva Sullivan is, is is putting the two, you know, th these two events have just become connected in the memory, or they might, on the other hand, they might have kept British Noble longer than they said before they killed her. I don't know. Okay, and it doesn't really matter. My point is, is that uh, is is to give you an example of how of how rich. The, the folklore and the memory on the ground is, and it actually does not, uh, it, it, it doesn't excise the violence or the, or the, you know, or the, or the more, you know, uh, grim parts of what happened during the War of Independence. And it's, and it's not, those are not unsympathetic, uh, unsympathetic portrayals of, of the British soldiers who were killed uh, after after Laurel Walk, uh, nor is that, uh, you know, necessarily a, an unsympathetic portrayal of her. So, I mean, you just, I suppose my point is, is that you actually just, that, that, that underneath these public stories, you have a much more interesting narrative. And so, and so that's, it for, you know, so, and, and these are the stories for people who wanted to hear these sorts of stories. Those were always there, you know. Um, and so it's important not to make too many generalizations about nationalist memory. Or anything else, um, and so uh, and and these stories, these stories that are kind of quieter stories, you know, is also like like some of the the, the you know, there's always anybody on the ground in West Cork knows there was more than one account of what happened at Kilmichael. It was nothing to do with delegitimizing the Irish independent struggle. It was just there was a disagreement about what happened, and that's the case for lots and lots of things that happened. And it's been all these these these. Um, Arguments have been kind of pulled out of context to be, become part of this wider kind of ideological struggle, or at least some people are doing this. And it's actually just really unhelpful because what it means is, is there's loads and loads of information and evidence out there that just never gets used or discussed or talked about because all people are interested in is trying to discredit the person they're arguing with. 
you know, so so it really is. I, I mean, I, it, it, I, I would certainly say that there's much more fruitful approaches uh, to this. Um, and what I think this, but the other interesting thing to say about this is that both of those stories, the information came from local IRA men. All right, that they are actually contributing to the survival of this, these sorts of stories as well as the kind of heroic narr published narratives. Uh, and I think this really, again, this is something that challenges so, some of the assumptions that are sometimes made about, about uh, local memory and even the, the memory of the veterans. And, I, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't actually apply to all of them. All right, there were certainly some of them, as far as they were concerned, it's very simple. There was nothing to feel regretful or remorseful about. It was a clean war. It was whatever. Or they didn't care. But for others, uh, although there was no evidence that they stopped believing in the culture they fought, or even that these sorts of ways of betraying them had anything to do with with uh, uh, stop, believe, you know the call, their belief in the cause that they fought for Irish independence. But it doesn't seem to have it doesn't seem to have prevented them from still at the same time feeling kind of regret that the fact that they had to do what they did, like John L. and Kenneth Griffiths a few years later told much the same story that you just heard from Bill O'Donoghue to, uh, to Kenneth Griffiths. And he said, he says something along the lines of, you know, there, how, how so that, like the, the, I think I have it written down, something about that. Yeah, the revulsion of taking a human life goes very deep in a person. And he's somebody, you know, and so all this, so, so, uh, um, and, and what's interesting is it doesn't actually, they, you know, and the, these, the, these sorts of attitudes, it doesn't seem to be tied to whether they actually thought the people were, were guilty or, or innocent, you know, which I think is very interesting. It was just something they kind of seemed to have felt on, on, a, on a humane love, level. So it's, I just, I'll just end here now with this. It's just something to think about, you know, even when you're looking at even the most doctrinaire public commemoration, you know, the idea that some of the people and some of the veterans standing there might have been uh, honoring more than, than, than what was said on the platform, you know, uh, and might have had their own reasons for being there. And also just to think a little bit, maybe to end, I was talking about the, the you know, about the function of ghost stories. And, and I'm, I'm thinking now of the, of the ghost who haunted John L's mother's house. You know, because it doesn't, it's not about with this, I'm not suggesting for a minute that, that, that these stories are real, right? But, the, but if you think of the symbolism of the ghost who stayed in his mother's house, because the, that, the, the footsteps of that young British soldier and the memory of that soldier echoed between John L. and his mother forever. And that, you see, I think, is, is if, you know, the, the ghost story can be read that way as a way of describing that tension in, in, in the family. Okay? Shanae, that's it. Eve, that was fascinating. Will you take one or two questions? Yes, um, I, I was amazed to hear you mention British Noble. I'm uh, uh, quite familiar with her story because I was doing research for my biography of Emmett Dalton and I came across correspondence in the military archives to do with her. And then I was down in um, the Barrow Peninsula. I spoke to a man whose family were neighbours of hers. And uh, he said that the reason why she got into trouble was that her husband had gone to England to work. She was worried about him. She was a very, very naive, unsophisticated lady. She would go to the RIC to see if they knew anything about him. And she was seen making these visits, and they decided to punish her without apparently asking her why she was making these visits. And she was a very feisty lady. Uh, she had married outside her ethnic and religious community, married to a Scots Presbyterian, even though he's a, declared as a Catholic in, in the 1911 census. And uh, they sent along seven or eight young men to punish her and to cut her hair off. And then she went to the RIC station, handed in a letter identifying the men who had done this. One was arrested. Uh, he was a brother of the local, the man who became the local commander of the battalion. And then they knew now that she was an informer. And they kidnapped her, as was stated there on the tape. And they took her away, kept her for a number of days, and then they killed her. And incidentally, uh, she's thought to have been put to death at Colerus. And there again, a legend grew up that the, the, the white lady was haunting the area of Colerus near Lorock. 
Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, there, there's definitely, see, there's, and that's the thing about these sorts of folkloric accounts. There's never just one. <laughs> there's, there's a million variations on the theme, just like that. And apparently I was told that actually the town was kind of, was really divided over this, this, uh, the, the killing of, of Mrs. Noble. Um, but there's somebody else, yeah? yeah? Yeah, just one comment, first of all, about ghost stories. Uh -huh. Some years ago, I was at um, the Parnell Summer School, and one of the speakers there claimed that John Dillon was quite convinced that years later, at an opera house on the continent, he saw the, uh, the ghost of Parnell. Right. And nothing would yeah. convince him <laughs> otherwise. Uh, one question then. Frank O'Connor's story, The Guest of the Nation, would that have anything to do with... John well, Ells. well, I tell you what, this is the thing. This is, I was, I was just, I write about this in my article. It, he says that he wrote Guest of a Nation after he overheard a conversation in an internment camp between two IRA men talking about killing two soldiers uh, and how t regretful they felt about it. Now, the thing is, the, the problem is, is there's more than one incident like this. So it could be this one or it could be uh, Steer and Motley. Who were killed? Who were who were who? Um, it was in a different part of Cork, but they were actually sent to Kerry to be killed. And I actually have interviews about that one from one of the guys involved, who basically said they were completely innocent uh, and they never should have been killed. This is another IRA, and I didn't I didn't play it today because um, uh, I haven't finished transcribing it, and it's not the the the, the recording is 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 um, is quite hard to understand. If there's anybody from East Cork. <laughs> who wants to volunteer to help me <laughs> understand some of the accents because they're actually they, like the East Cork accents I find are, are harder to understand than the West Cork ones um, but that's why I didn't so the thing is so yes you're right uh, and, and so it, I suspect it's either one of it's either uh, Steer and Motley or Taylor and, and Watling but I'm not sure which yeah um, Dona Koshe um, just on the John, L, the John L. O'Sullivan episode uh, that would be unusual, like that they would keep an informer say if the, the three of the family were actually volunteers, that would be unusual that they would keep them, I, mean, I can't dispute it, it would be unusual that, that they would keep the prisoner in their own house because of account of the British Army, we would know that they were involved obviously, so I would find that unusual, like, but just going back to, I, I suppose being involved in a guerrilla war, like, is much more personal, say for example, the men that fought at King Michael, they could see there are opposition straight in front of them. They could look into their eyes, like say, as against as against conventional warfare, you don't have the same scrutiny, like because you might have men inside in trenches, uh, miles apart, or say if they're firing cruise missiles and so on. So, in guerrilla warfare, I think it's different. It's more personal in lots of cases because the guerrilla has to, in many cases, act on his own uh, uh, initiative. And it's much more personal, and you may probably have to make more local decisions. You don't have the large command structure that you would have in a conventional warfare. But just going back to the, which you, you, raised it, you raised it there yourself about Kilmichael, which is, uh, has been a very controversial issue in recent years regarding the false surrender. Uh, in Tom Barry, in his book in 1948 that he wrote, he, he, he first, well, I think it was actually mentioned before that as well, he raised that in, in his book but it has become quite a controversy following uh, Peter Hart's book. But uh, I was just reading a, a book there, um, or uh, reading the Military Bureau of History um, last night there, and Jack Hennessy from Belnean. <coughs> it appears that there was a number of false surrenders by individual soldiers, because one soldier, he says in his Military Bureau record, that the soldier dropped his rifle to surrender, and then he drew a revolver. So Jack Hennessy then said he had no ammunition left, so he, he, he had to kill him, kill him with the butt of the rifle, the bayonet of the rifle, sorry. So <clears throat> there was another uh, volunteer also involved, uh, John Lord, and a soldier also made it, surrendered to him, and then he drew. So there was actually a number of false surrenders. So it's not true. Like The general, the general feeling in West Cork is that there was a false surrender. Now, Peter Hart has raised this issue like and it has caused quite a controversy. Like, so um, like, like people mightn't agree, and I don't think they will agree, but uh, I think uh, the, the Kilmichael ambush like, was, a, was a major event in, our, in Irish history. I suppose uh, it really struck at the heart of the British establishment. And I suppose, look, Miss Cock, people see it as a great victory for the cause of Irish freedom during that period. 
No, people might have issues with Tom Barry, I don't know. Tom Barry was accepted as a great leader by all the men of the flying column. And uh, I can't say any more about that. Like, I, I, I might believe that there was a false surrender, sur a surrender, a false surrender, and a number of false surrenders. No, some of them were verbal, and some of them weren't. So, Grim Margaret. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> you can, I mean, I'm not telling people what to believe. All right, my, my point was never that. Yes, lots of Kil some Kilmichael veterans said there was, there was a false surrender. Other veterans said it had happened differently. Okay, that was my point in my article, and that's all I've said since. I'm not sure, and nobody's ever going to be 100% sure which one is right. All right, but the point is there's always been more than one version of events. All right, and it was absolutely ridiculous to, to have ever accused uh, Peter Hart of making up uh, his interviews and pretending to interview people. I mean, that's, it's just, it's complete nonsense. You know, so, and, this, it was and it was a complete distraction um, from the arguments. I mean, and, and so, and it's, and it's actually a very dull argument that I think most people are, are tired of. I mean, what I, and what happened at Kilmichael was much more interesting than that, you know. So, can, huh? can, but he didn't interview a dead man. Can no. I, can I, because briefly, because we aren't, we have now run out of time for this session, I know that this and related subjects are going to be very uh, topical later on in the course of the afternoon, and we have both two more very interesting uh, contributions on related subjects, and then a panel that will have the opportunity to discuss uh, in a plenary session uh, all of this, but I am keen not to limit the time that uh, our next contributor, Dan Mulhall, has for his paper, but I would like to thank... Eve and earlier Barry for uh, two fascinating contributions and I think you'll all like to thank them now. <laughs>